We'll go ahead and get started. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Dan Hooper giving a colloquium this week. So uh, Dan uh, received his PhD in 2003 with Francis Halden. Yep. Uh, working in neutrino astrophysics at that time. Mostly. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Then he went uh, for his first postdoc to Oxford and then finally became the Schramm Fellow at Fermilab. Uh, and has been uh, in Chicagoland since, ever since then. Uh, I actually first met Dan in 2007, um, when at the time, we were all pretty excited about the WMAP case, okay? And so Dan and I made a bet about whether dark matter would be definitively discovered within five years. And the, the terms of the bet were that, this was the best part, so I said no, he said yes. Uh, the terms of the bet were that the loser would go around staying in the talk for a year, but the winner was right. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty steep terms in the bet. I was hedging because I figured, well, if we discovered dark matter, I could say this with a smile on my face. <laughs> um, uh, so 2012 rolled around. And at that time we were in the middle of, I would say dark matter fever. There were multiple entities showing up in both direct and indirect detection. There was the W, the WMAP case was still around at that time. There's the Galactic Center access, which Dan's going to talk about today. There were some entities in direct detection experiments that we weren't sure of. All of them kind of pointed to dark matter candidate in the 10 GV range. So we decided to put on hold, okay, resolving this bet, and we actually augmented it with a hundred dollar bottle of wine. Uh, so subsequently, actually, all of these ecstasies, save one, save the one that you'll talk about today, have been, you know, definitively ruled out. So Dan seated the bed. We were just trying to talk about what year he seated the bed. He did go around, I told, I haven't checked, staying in his talk for a year that I won the bed. It was a lot of talks. Yeah. It was a lot of concessions. I'm sure it was a lot of concessions. Uh, and uh, and I and I actually drank the the it was a very nice bottle of Barolo last uh, last uh, Thanksgiving, uh, but but one of those uh, ecstasies, which I think you can say fairly is really unresolved. Uh, I think it's consistent with dark matter. Uh, I think that if you talk to other people, they'll say that well you can stretch the astrophysics a little bit and maybe make it consistent with an astrophysical source. That's what we're going to talk about today, uh, but we're very happy to hear about uh, a possible evidence for dark matter. So Thanks so much, Catherine. It's great to be here. Um, I didn't realize until I walked into this room that this was the famous lecture hall that Feynman did all of his uh, historic work in. Um, but I, I kind of recognized the chalkboards. I thought, is this really? A... But it's great to be here for lots of reasons. All right. So I think I really like this image because I think it, it it captures the kind of sentiment or feeling we have in the dark matter community, not only today, but for like the last 10 years or something. The main point here is that we have a lot of ideas for what dark matter might be. We have heavy and light and strongly interacting, weakly interacting, all sorts of different ideas. Some are top-down models, some are just effective field theory, bottom-up models, and everything in between. Um, and you can plot this in a lot of different ways. One axis is along the mass of the constituents, the particles or, or otherwise that make up the dark matter. Um, is there a laser pointer somewhere I can, or, or some sort of pointer I can get? Point to? All right, I can do it. All right, so this is one of the axes. Um, you could, the dark matter could consist of anything from, there we go, from, everything from ultra light to what we call fuzzy dark matter, probably 10 to the minus 22 is ruled out now, but maybe 10 to the minus 20 or something electron volts, all the way up to quite macroscopic objects, like 100 or something solar masses. That's again, probably on the edge of being ruled out, but you have many, many, many orders of magnitude to play with here. But don't be, don't be misled by this. It, this, this whole strip of, of possibilities is not like equally well motivated or therefore equally likely. In fact, I would argue that this relatively narrow range here between the MEV scale and roughly the 100 TV scale is first and foremost our best guess as to where the dark matter is likely to live. So these are what I call WIMPs or, or thermal relics of the Big Bang, if you prefer, uh, particles that froze out of equilibrium at some early time. 
So the idea here is that if we assume that the dark matter, well, we just, we're just, I'm just gonna make a couple of, 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 of very kind of generic assumptions. They're not bulletproof, but they're pretty generic. One is that the dark matter was at some point in thermal equilibrium in the early universe, and that the early universe was radiation dominated, like in standard cosmology. If you assume those two things, then the dark matter has to be heavier than about you know, a few MeV. Otherwise, you'll screw up the successful predictions of BPN, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And it has to be lighter than about 100 TeV, or you produce too much of it, Okay, no matter, no matter what kind of theory you write down. So we have kind of this very special mass range to focus on. And then furthermore, if you want this particle to freeze out with the abundance that equals the dark matter abundance we observe in our universe today, it takes a, an interaction strength, a annihilation cross-section that is roughly equal to the, the predictions of a, a weak scale, like electroweak interaction with mediated by electroweak scale particles. So this has uh, motivated a lot of weakly interacting massive particle theories that we call the somewhat miracle if you want, uh, whatever. It's, uh, it motivates weakly interacting weak scale particles as thermal relics of the Big Bang. And I think this is a particularly well-motivated class of dark matter candidates. Recent years haven't been good overall for the WIMP, however. So the thermal relic abundance calculation uh, provided us with a bunch of benchmarks, not just one, but a whole lot of them. And um, over the last decade, a lot of our favorite WIMP candidates were going to fall within the reach of new experiments. And that kind of happened. Um, in particular, over the last 20 years or so, the direct detection program has increased in sensitivity at a rate that's faster than Moore's law, which is when you think about what computers were like 20 years ago, you know that's a really impressive accomplishment. Uh, frankly, it's better than I think we had any right to expect. And furthermore, the LHC has performed beautifully, right? And yet it hasn't discovered any compelling evidence of dark matter or really any other BSM physics. So let's talk about each of these one at a time. So. The LHC has put really strong constraints on certain kinds of particles, not all kinds, but certain kinds. In particular, strongly interacting particles, particles you could produce with large cross sections are now very tightly constrained. For example, if I want to write down a supersymmetry model, the squarks and glinos have to be heavier than a, you know, a TV or two to evade these constraints. Um, another possibility or another thing that's really tightly constrained are, are, are the dijet or dilepton signals you get from a new gauge boson. These are the sorts of things the LHC has been very good at constraining. In contrast, the constraints that the LHC provides on WIMPs are pretty weak. They don't really tell us much about the nature of dark matter. For example, you can write down lots of supersymmetry models just as a benchmark uh, that are consistent with all of the existing collider constraints so long as the squarks and glinos in the theory are pretty heavy. Direct detection experiments, in my opinion, have told us more about the nature of dark matter than the LEC has. Um, I think it is a fair statement, and exactly how you parse this is, is, is a little bit subjective, but I think it's fair to say that most simple, simple WIMP models that have written down uh, prior to the last decade or so generically predict scattering rates that are larger, with nuclei that is, that are larger than the current constraints. So not all, but a lot of dark matter candidates that I, I, I would consider to be part of the greater WIMP paradigm have been ruled out over this period of time. All right, so the question to ask now is like, should we consider this paradigm dead? Should we discard it and move on to other ideas? And there are other good ideas, um, but I don't think that's exactly what we should be doing yet. Um, in fact, despite the fact that these stringent constraints have been placed by the LAC and by uh, direct detection experiments, I think there are lots of, there are in fact lots of viable WIMP model building possibilities that we can continue to explore. And I'm going to give you kind of a laundry list of things you might want to do if you're a model builder to try to save your favorite WIMP. So I'm going to give you a list of, I think, six or seven different classes of ideas, um, but they all have a common theme. Namely, we're going to build into the model some sort of mechanism that allows us to deplete the dark matter abundance efficiently in the early universe without leading to large elastic scattering cross sections with nuclei. That's the trick here. Um, and it turns out there are lots of ways to do that. First of all, we could, instead of relying on dark matter annihilations, we could rely on co-annihilations between the dark matter and some other state. Okay, so in this particular diagram, I've shown another example from supersymmetry. Um, here's my dark matter candidate, and here's a slightly heavier stow, the superpartner of the tau, and those can annihilate the center model particles, depleting my dark matter abundance. But there's nothing I can do at tree level anyway to turn this diagram into something that will uh, allow my WIMP to scatter with nuclei. So I can kind of evade these direct detection constraints 
uh, almost trivially. Uh, roughly speaking, these sorts of processes, these co-annihilation processes can be effective in setting the dark matter's relic abundance as so long as the dark matter and the co-annihilating species are pretty degenerate in mass about within 10% or so. So it requires a, a very modest or mild degree of tuning, but other than that, it can kind of all work. The second idea is that maybe your dark matter annihilates not into quarks and gluons that are, of course, abundant and common in nuclei, but into maybe gauge or Higgs bosons or leptons for that matter. In this case, you can only generate elastic scattering processes through loop level diagrams. So here's an example again, my WIMPs annihilating the Ws and Cs. If I wanna connect this to uh, quarks in a, nucle a nucleus, I have to do these sorts of loop level diagrams. And that suppresses the scattering rate sufficiently in many cases to evade current constraints. So these, these sorts of cross-sections you get, for example, here's what you get in the Wino and Higgsino case. Um, those are small, but they're not so small that we couldn't hope to see them maybe in future direct detection experiments. So it's not hopeless, but it's uh, for now, it's a, a safe uh, collection of, of models. You could also write down, and this is more of a bottom-up perspective, but you could write down effective operators where the, which allow the dark matter to uh, annihilate efficiently in the early universe but scatter with nuclei at low velocities uh, at rates that are suppressed by powers, usually even number powers of velocity or momentum transfer, okay? Since the halo contains particles that are moving at roughly 10 to the minus three of the speed of light, this translates into suppression factors of the elastic scattering cross-section, therefore direct detection rate of maybe 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus 12, easily allowing you to lie below current constraints. A simple way to do this is just to have the dark matter be lighter than a few GeV. So the current constraints we have um, are quite stringent down here at uh, you know 10 GeV and, and above. But down here, there's a whole lot of parameter space you might want to choose to live in, and that is currently perfectly phenomenologically, phenomenologically viable. People are developing new technologies to try to explore this region, but at this point, they just uh, haven't been constrained very tightly at all yet. So far, I've been talking about particle physics, but I could also do things in the in, in, in my cosmological model by changing the conditions of the early universe to, to uh, solve this problem. After all, we don't have any direct observations of what forms of matter or energy dominated the energy density of the universe prior to BBN. Um, you can write down a lot of perfectly well-motivated and viable scenarios where the early, early universe may have contained, included a, a matter-dominated era. And, and if you have this sort of departure from the standard radiation dominated picture, you can construct scenarios where the relic abundance was set to the right, the, the desired uh, dark matter abundance, while leading to much smaller couplings and therefore scattering rates with nuclei. And then last but not least, we can imagine dark matter as part of some sort of hidden sector. By hidden sector, I mean a series of particles that interact among themselves, but that don't themselves contain or uh, have any uh, standard model gauge charges. Um, but even without any direct couplings to the standard model, uh, we can introduce these small portal interactions that can allow some of these dark matter sectors, uh, dark sector particles to interact uh, feebly, very feebly with, with the standard model. So a picture you could have in your mind is one in which the dark matter shown as the symbol X here annihilates through some process to a lighter hidden sector state Y. And then that, that Y particle decays rather slowly through a small portal coupling to the standard model. This will give you a relic abundance in the same way that a standard WIMP will, okay? So we have a, an annihilation cross-section with weak scale masses and cross-sections give you the right relic abundance and everything, but that because of the small portal coupling will suppress, perhaps uh, very strongly suppress the elastic scattering cross-section with nuclei, as well as the rates of any kind of signals at uh, the LHC. All right, so I've just given you a long laundry list of ways that you can write down perfectly viable WIMP models. And in each of these ways has many, many, many different examples or realizations. These are just kind of classes of ideas. You might find that this would be kind of depressing. After all, I've just said that, well, here are a bunch of ways you can write down WIMP models that you can't test using our colliders or using direct detection experiments. And it might seem like I'm proposing some completely untestable uh, rabbit hole uh, of, of models. But I'd emphasize that most of these ideas, all the ones I've shaded here, give you no reason to think that the annihilation signal in the halo today would be suppressed. 
So indirect detection signals, by which I mean the gamma rays or cosmic rays that might be produced in dark matter annihilations in the halo of the Milky Way, should still be just as big as with standard WIMPs in at least most of these scenarios I've written down. And I think this provides an important set of motivations for indirect searches. Okay, pivoting now to indirect detection. To account, I'll remind you to account for the observed dark matter abundance in our universe today. The dark matter candidates, if they're thermal relics, have to annihilate at with a cross section of about two times 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second, at least as evaluated at the temperature of, of their freeze out in the early universe. This is a number that would be good to keep in the back of your mind throughout the rest of this talk. There are lots of model dependent factors that could make this cross section be either larger or smaller at low temperatures as found in the halo today. But generically speaking, most WIMP models you can write down have annihilation cross sections at low velocities that are within roughly an order of magnitude or so of this two times 10 to the minus 26 benchmark. So from this perspective, if we can deploy telescopes or other instruments that can be sensitive to WIMPs annihilating at approximately this cross section, we can meaningfully test a, 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 the WIMP paradigm or at least a large fraction of the WIMP models you might be most interested in. So already we've had a bunch of instruments provide pretty st stringent constraints on this class of ideas, the, the sort of thermal, uh, thermal relic benchmark uh, cross section. Uh, gamma ray telescopes like Fermi in particular, but others as well, have uh, observed the galactic center, dwarf seroidal galaxies, the isotropic gamma ray background and other targets. Um, and uh, cosmic ray measurements, uh, particularly of antimatter, like positrons and antiprotons by AMS and other instruments, um, have all been able to probe uh, the thermal relic benchmark for masses up to about roughly 100 GeV or something. So here we have the uh, constraints on, uh, from the cosmic ray positron spectrum. And you can see that for dark matter that annihilates mostly to electrons or muons, you can get pretty strong constraints, ruling out the, the, uh, rel the thermal relic benchmark up to masses of a couple hundred GeV. Here we have uh, the, the Fermi collaborations constraints from their observations of gamma rays from dwarf seroidal galaxies. And here we can, for hadronic annihilation channels, we can get up to, up to uh, a few tens of GeV in the constraints. And then here we have AMS's measurement, uh, uh, constraints from the AMS measurements of the antiproton spectrum. And again, for hadronic channels. And with the exception of this little range here, you can get up to about the TV scale in, in, in terms of the constraints on, uh, on hadronically annihilating WIMPs. This little feature here comes from a small excess, which may or may not have anything to do with dark matter, but it, it certainly blinds us to dark matter in that mass range. which brings us to the galactic center gamma ray access or, or sometimes called the GEV access. So um, I imagine a lot of you have heard of this, but I also imagine most of you don't know much about it. So I'm gonna kind of give you a, a brief tour of its, of its primary features. And then we're gonna pivot and we're gonna talk about the different hypotheses people have for what might generate the signal and what tests we can do to try to discern where it really comes from. Um, first of all, I just wanna emphasize this signal's really bright. It's hard to not find it in the data analysis at this point. And um, I don't think anyone is arguing um, that the signal doesn't exist. Okay, there were, there were a long, long series of years where it was hard for me to try to convince people that the signal was really there. Those years are behind us. We now all agree the signal is there and it brought, has the same broad features that I'm gonna to describe to you today. I also don't think it's controversial to say that it's been difficult to explain the signal with known or proposed astrophysics. Maybe not impossible, but uh, stuff out of the box hasn't worked. Um, and I also don't think it's uh, controversial to say that the observed characteristics of the signal are consistent with the signal you ha had long expected from annihilating WIMPs. And here are a bunch of papers that kind of describe the early work on the subject. Okay, so let's talk about the features of the signal. We'll start with the morphology. So the excess uh, is approximately spherically symmetrically distributed with respect to the galactic center. Um, and, and quantitatively, the axis ratios, if you try to stretch it and make it an ellipse instead of a sphere, um, you'd find that uh, anything more than about a 20% 20 20 departure from unity will give you a significantly worse fit. And the flux falls like the distance to the galactic center to the minus 2.4 power out to at least 20 degrees from the galactic center. So it's very big, it's very spatially extended. 
And it's not that the signal goes away, then it just gets lost in the noise. So it probably extends beyond 20 degrees. If we interpret that, that morphology in terms of a signal of annihilating dark matter, it would imply a halo profile that uh, goes like R to the minus 1.2. Okay, and this is uh, slightly steeper than the one over R behavior that's attributed to a, a classic Navarro Frank White profile. Um, maybe a little bit of baryonic contraction would steepen that profile to 1.2. Um, I think it's important to point out that stellar populations don't look like this. Okay, the stellar populations are, are some mixture of disk and bulge like characteristics, and, and they don't look spherical, they don't extend to 20 degrees. So, um, what what's five by five degrees well that's we see the signal out to much farther than that well this is 20 degrees i mean <laughs> trust me I, this is this is one picture at one one scale it definitely extends well beyond the confines of this picture um that is a consensus view by everybody who studied the data okay so the stellar populations do not look like this morphology. Um, instead, this looks like something a little bit steeper than FW that extends at least to a few kiloparsecs away from the galactic center. All right, so that's the spectrum or the morphology. Let's talk about the spectrum. Um, you can fit the shape of the spectrum, which peaks at you know two or three GB, pretty well by a wimp in the range of 20 to 65 GB, depending on what you're annihilating to. So if you're annihilating to BB bar, which is a common benchmark you probably want a uh, mass of around 50 or so GB, but if you have lighter cores, you can, go to, you can have a lighter wind. If you go to gluons, it can be a little bit heavier. Okay, so those are the sort of mass ranges you should have in mind. Also, it's important to note that the shape of the spectrum appears uniform across the region of the sky we can observe this in. So here's a map of the galactic center and you have a bunch of different regions here. Here are the spectra of the excess attributed to these different parts of the sky. And you can see that the shape here is consistent with the shape here, is consistent with the shape here, and so on and so forth. And this helps us to test, for example, inverse Compton scattering models where there were uh, electrons uh, injected from the galactic center and propagating outward. If that, if that were the, the explanation for this, then you would expect the outer parts of the region to have a softer spectrum due to cooling than the inner parts, and that is not observed. So next, the overall normalization of the signal. Um, if you want to normalize this with annihilating dark matter, you need a cross section within a factor of two or three of the canonical two times to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second number. This is either a remarkable coincidence, which of course it could be, or it's indicative that this is from an annihilating wimp that's a thermal relic of the Big Bang. Of course, we don't know that's true, but it's certainly, uh, certainly enticing. Um, at this point, the debate has moved on from anything I've said so far. I think everything I've said so far is a complete consensus view of the uh, of those who've studied the problem. Uh, where things are are far from consensus is in, in the debate of what generates the signal at hand. So, um, of course, the annihilating dark matter signal is is the main thing I'm focusing on here today, and and, and what I think is uh, is uh, maybe well certainly the most exciting possibility, but also the most likely. But there's also a competing theory in that in, in, in a large in, in that the signal could be generated by a large population of spherically distributed, centrally concentrated millisecond pulsars. All right, so millisecond pulsars. This is my 101 tutorial on pulsars. Uh, these are rapidly spinning neutron stars, which gradually convert the rotational kinetic energy into radio and gamma ray emission, and probably also plus or minus pairs. Uh, young pulsars, the kind that are left behind after a supernova explosion, um, have periods that are typically in the order of a second, and they slow down due to magnetic dipole breaking and become faint on time scales of millions or tens or hundreds of millions of years. Some of these, so I should point to this in my PP dot diagram, so the period and the time derivative of the period. Uh, these are my young pulsars, and they evolve along lines of roughly constant magnetic field until they become faint and they lie beyond the, what we call a pulsar graveyard. But now some, some of these will have interactions with a binary companion, causing them to move from this region over into this region, okay? And this is where the millisecond uh, pulsars reside. So these are millisecond pulsars, uh, these spun up or recycled pulsars, 
have much weaker magnetic fields, much higher periods than young pulsars. And the combination of those two things leads to pulsars that are comparably bright to young pulsars, but that evolve much, much more slowly. These guys can remain uh, highly luminous uh, for as long as billions of years. And because they remain luminous for so long, it's at least plausible that a large population of them could have built up in the inner galaxy over the history of the Milky Way. All right, so if you look in the literature, you'll find really three different kinds of arguments in favor of millisecond pulsars as the main source of the galactic center gamma ray access. Um, they're here. I don't believe there are any other arguments that I'm aware of. The first of these arguments is, in my opinion, the, the really solid one. In particular, they point out that the spectrum we observe from the galactic center excess is pretty similar to the average spectrum of millisecond pulsars we observe um, in populations in the disk and in globular clusters. Okay, This is, in fact, the reason why we're talking about pulsars at all. It's the fact that their spectrum looks a lot like that of an annihilating 40 or 50 GB. Yeah. Um, at low energies, the spectra are a little bit different. You can see there's more low energy emission here than you can attribute to the excess, but I think that's well within the systematic uncertainties, and I, I, I would encourage you not to worry too much about that. The other two arguments, um, namely that the, there have been in the past claims that there's small scale power in the gamma ray emission from the inner galaxy, and that the excess traces the morphology of the galactic bulge and bar, both of these have basically been uh, jettisoned in the, in the last few years to varying degrees. And I'm going to go through these in, in some more detail, but I think most of the community doesn't think that these arguments hold weight at this time. Okay, so let's start by talking about the small scale power claims. So back in 2015, two independent groups using completely different uh, analysis techniques reported that the GV scale photons from the direction of the inner galaxy seem to be more clustered, clustered um, than you would have expected from the smooth backgrounds. And they argued that this suggested that the GV emission, or uh, the GV excess, I should say, might be generated by a large population of unresolved point sources. So the first of these groups, the Lee et al. group, to, uh, used a non-Poissonian template technique or method to, to do this. And they basically showed that the gamma ray distribution in the galactic center is clumpy, and they argued that roughly a thousand or so unresolved point sources could collectively generate the galactic center gamma ray access. Bartles et al. reached a qualitatively similar um, uh, conclusion using a completely de different technique involving spatial wavelets. And I'll talk a little bit about both of these one at a time. But before I do, I want to kind of illustrate what, in a, as a cartoon, what I think um, the, the concern um, that would ultimately uh, lead to trouble with these analyses would be. In particular, it's difficult to tell whether the clustered gamma rays that were observed in these techniques were really from unresolved point sources or were the consequence of backgrounds that are actually less smooth than their modeling. So here's an example. This is a cartoon. Here's some one dimensional representation of where you're pointing your telescope, and here's the flux. So let's say you observe this black line, okay? Um, and let's imagine that you think your background, which is most of the observed emission is smooth and you understand uh, how to model it. If you do a subtraction of those two things, you find that the signal, your excess looks like this, and that looks awfully clumpy. And um, maybe that's coming from a bunch of point sources, okay? On the other hand, I could take exactly the same data and I can say, well, maybe my excess is smooth, maybe like from dark matter. And then I do a subtraction and I find that my background really looks like this. So if you think you can model your background really well, like for example, in this case, you would know where all the gas was distributed, how the cosmic rays are distributed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in the inner kiloparsec or two, then you could do something like this. But on the other hand, maybe you don't know the small scale power of your gas and cosmic rays well enough and in fact, you're modeling it like this when it's actually like this, causing your, your smooth uh, signal to appear artificially clumpy. So there's been a hard X-ray excess both from the galactic center and the galactic ridge. How well does this really correlate? Do you correlate it? Yeah, so that's a an, an very, very small 
angular region. So this extends to 20 degrees, right? I think that X-ray excess traces the very high energy gamma ray uh, emission, which is um, what, like a, a half a degree or something. So um, this, I would, I would say they, they're, they're not particularly correlated and they don't seem to have any relationship. At least not most of it. Okay. So between 2015 and 2019, I was, you know, using slides, you know, like this one to say, like, in principle, this might go wrong. I'm not completely sure it's point sources, but I couldn't, I didn't have any way of showing that it wasn't point sources. And then this paper came out by Rebecca Lean and Tracy Slatcher. Tracy was one of the authors of the original Nanposanian uh, study. So she, she was kind of in the story from the very beginning. Um, and by the way, this is not the title that the journal eventually published it in, but it was their original title in the archive, and I prefer it, so I'm just leaving it in. But let me walk you through what they found. All right, so they started out and just like reproducing the results from the original 2015 paper. And this is an example of, a, of that, that, that 2015 result. So this shows um, the probability that each component in their fit would uh, make up a certain fraction of the overall flux. The thing I want to draw your eye to is this histogram down here. I believe it's red, but I'm colorblind. This histogram is the piece that they, their, their fit attributes to spherically symmetric, smooth, dark matter like emission. And then up here, this part I'm going to call green, but again, how would I know? This is the fraction of the flux that their fit attributes to point like, but dark matter like distributed emissions. So this would be the pulsar population if you want to interpret it this way. And what Rebecca and Tracy tried to sort out with this, their analysis is asking the sort of question I was before, if you have bad background templates or inadequate back, background templates, how much could those templates bias your results uh, one way or the other? So this is what Tracy and Rebecca find. It, it is completely consistent with the last slide I showed you. This is basically using the same data and uh, same techniques. And then what they did is they took that Fermi data, the real data, and added simulated data to it that was simulated under the assumption that it was smooth and dark matter-like. So if that technique works, then what should happen? Then the dark matter bit should move this way, and the, uh, and the, piece, the point source piece should stay fixed. They wanted to test if that would happen. So despite having just added a dark matter-like signal to the data, the fit does not ascribe any of it to dark matter. So you see the dark matter is still here at zero, despite having added this extra flux. On the other hand, this piece, the point source piece, moved from just over 2% here to almost 4%. So the fit, because the templates are inadequate to do this job, the fit is attributing the, the, the by design dark matter-like signal to point sources. And you can take this farther. You can add even a bigger signal, a dark matter-like signal, and it just keeps wanting to attribute it to point sources. So think back to those car that cartoon I showed you before. If your background is really full of small-scale power and you don't know it because you don't have an adequate background template or model, your fit will prefer to give your signal as much small scale power as it can, even if it's smooth. And that was what was going on here. The bottom line is that the non bosonian template fit is clearly misattributing the dark matter like signal to point sources, demonstrating that the templates being used here are not adequate to describe the data and strongly biasing the results of the fit. Of course, the excess could still be generated by a large population of faint point sources, pulsars or otherwise, but there isn't any evidence of that at this time. I don't think this should be a controversial point. I don't know of anybody act actively arguing against it at this point. Um, again, I want to emphasize this does not rule out point sources, but it would require that they be very numerous and very faint if they're to generate the signal. All right, so that was a non Poissonian fit. Uh, let me say a couple of words about the wavelet technique. Um, so this was, again, 2015. Bartels et al. Uh, used this wavelet-based technique, um, and they claimed to find strong support for, for point source like emission. Uh, they, they, they associated it with millisecond pulsars, but I, really it's just point source emission, point like emission. But more recently, uh, Yiming Zong, along with Ilias Cholis and Sam McDermott and Patty Fox, revisited this method. 
And they were going to do a whole bunch of complicated things to test it, kind of like Tracy and Rebecca did. Uh, but they found very quickly that all they had to do to get to the bottom of this problem is update the point source catalog. So in the original Bartles paper, they used this old 3FGL paper or a catalog, which was the state of the art at the time. But when you just use Fermi's updated catalog, the 4FGL, all the evidence that Bar Bartles at all had reported for a point source origin of the Gladix interaxis just evaporated, just went away entirely. Um, instead, they could just put really strong constraints on the luminosity function of any point source population that might be responsible. All right, so that's all I want to say about small scale power for now. I want to now go to the, the questions of the, of the, the, the detailed morphology of the Gladix center access or the morphology, the bulge bar versus dark matter like morphology question of the signal. Of course, it's an important test of the origin of the signal to establish whether it traces a dark matter profile squared or instead it, whether it traces some combination of known stellar populations like those attributed to the Bolger bar. Um, so this is what you'd expect a signal to look like if it's from dark matter. This is what you'd expect if it came, if it traced the stellar populations we call the boxy bulge or the nuclear bulge or the X-shaped bulge. And in these papers shown below, it was argued that some combination of these three templates provided a noticeably better fit to the data than this does. Recent work, however, has just not found that to be true. Okay, so um, all the new groups who have tried to do this, including uh, the Damaro, who is one of the Fermi collaborators, and also the Cholas Zong McDermott, uh, studies, both of these find strong statistical preferences for spherical morphology over the kinds of uh, bar, bulge and bulge uh, templates that were used in those other studies. So this is an example from the 2021 Chola study. The idea here is we can change the uh, overall quality of the fit, depending on whether we use a dark matter-like uh, template, some combination of boxy and nuclear bulges, or some sort of X-shaped bulge template. Um, the farther you go down in this plane, the better the fit is to the data. And, and it's a big, big variety here. So this is a 8,000. So it's a huge improvement in fit from going from the top to the bottom. And the thing you'll notice that for all of the models that provide a reasonable fit to the data, they strongly prefer the spherical morphology to either sets of stellar templates. Um, it's not exactly clear to me what's going on here, like why some groups get one answer and some get the other. Um, we are actively trying to sort this out as we speak. Um, the differences could be indicative of some sort of systematic uncertainties associated with the choice of astrophysical templates, but I kind of doubt that at this point. It also might be a, a simple failure uh, to find the true global minimum. These are very, very highly multidimensional fits. And if, and if you find yourself in a local minimum, you might trick yourself into thinking one template provides a better fit than the other. Um, but I think the most sophisticated analyses like those from the Cholis group um, are, are, are pretty compelling in, in, in showing that they really do favor a spherical morphology over stellar templates. Okay, so going back to this, these were the three arguments that appear in the literature favoring pulsars. And um, I'm convinced that these two don't carry weight at this point. And I think most of the community is with me on that. Um, and then in addition to that, there are a bunch of arguments in the literature favoring uh, dark matter over pulsar interpretations, or at least arguing against pulsars um, as we observe them elsewhere in uh, the Milky Way. I just want to emphasize we've never seen a millisecond pulsar. Yes? Why do you like why is just about pulsars but not black holes? Could you repeat that again? Why is just about pulsars but not black holes? Um, well, black holes don't make gamma ray emission with the spectrum. It's like about the the, the matter that is that orbiting the black hole may. Well, that okay. So so Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole, is a gamma ray emitter, but it's a point source. Okay, the signal I'm talking about is extended by 20 degrees. So we have a separate point source in all our fits. It can absorb as much as Sagittarius A star can put out, um, and that, that's just part of the fit, but that's not what I'm calling the excess. Good. All right. Uh, to be clear, we've never seen a millisecond pulsar anywhere near the inner galaxy. Um, they could be there, but we have never seen one in radio or gamma rays. 
uh, this, this group of authors argued that these three particular uh, millisecond pulsars might be part of an intergalaxy population, but if you just look them up, you find out that they have measurements to their dis uh, the measurements of their distances, and they're actually nowhere near the galactic center. I don't know why they claim that, but um, this has been pointed out to them, and they they stand by their uh, false claims. Um, furthermore, we can actually you know quantitatively ask the question of uh, could any of the faint gamma ray sources we see in the in the direction of the inner galaxy could any of these uh, be, be a significant part of the galactic center access. So what we did in this paper here with Bartles and Tim Linden and Sid Mishra Sharma, Nick Rod, Ben Safdie, Tracy Slasher, is we did the standard template fit, extracted a spectrum of the excess, and then we took a mask and just covered every two sigma or higher point source candidate and did it again. And we found that the spectrum, including the intensity and, and shape of the galactic center excess, remained unchanged. So whatever generates this excess, if it's point sources, they have to be so faint as to not even show up as point source candidates in large numbers in the Fermi data. So they're very, very faint objects um, if, if they're point sources. So if we look at the millisecond pulsar populations that we observe by which I mean in the disk of the Milky Way and in the globular cluster population of the Milky Way, we find that they both have luminosity functions that peak in the range of 10 to the 34 to 10 to the 35 ergs per second. That's an L squared DNDL units. Um, if the excess, so the galactic center excess is produced by millisecond pulsars with a similar luminosity function, we should have expected um, Fermi to have already resolved at high significance about 100 millisecond pulsars. So again, they haven't seen any, okay? So anything like that is completely ruled out. Um, if we were to model the luminosity function of these pulsars as a power law, and I'm not saying you necessarily should do that, but just as a toy model, uh, Cholis et al. find that you need about 3 million millisecond pulsars to explain that with luminosities about 10 to the minus 29 ergs per second. Um, nobody thinks that is physically plausible. Um, the fewest number of millisecond pulsars that you could in invoke to try to explain the signal is about 30,000 or so approximately. Um, but this would require a luminosity function that peaks sharply just below Fermi's point source threshold, okay? So you would have almost all of the, the emission come from sources that are within a factor of two or so of its threshold. Again, we've never seen any pulsar population with a sharply peak luminosity function the luminosity functions are actually quite broad in general. So this would be very, very exotic. Um, but of course, at this point, we can't rule out um, anything, even, even something that we take to be exotic. So another argument against pulsars is the relative lack of bright X-ray sources from the inner galaxy. So millisecond pulsars are formed uh, when they are spun up by a binary companion. And the precursor to the millisecond pulsar state is something we call a low mass X-ray binary or LMXB. By measuring the ratio of the gamma ray emission, uh, presumably comes from millisecond pulsars, to the number of bright low mass X-ray binaries and globular clusters, we can then compare this to the bright number of LMXBs in the inner galaxy to get an estimate for how much of the gamma ray emission could come from millisecond pulsars. So here, here's that, that an, an equation instead of words. So we look in globular clusters, we measure the gamma ray flux, we measure the number of bright X-ray sources, we compare that to the inner galaxy with the same ratio, and we infer how much gamma ray emission should come from the millisecond pulsars. When we do this, we estimate that between four and 11% of the GCE might come from pulsars. So not zero, but certainly nothing like all of it. Um, putting this another way, if the entire GCE access was coming from millisecond pulsars, the integral telescope should have detected about a thousand bright low mass X-ray binaries in the inner galaxy, but they actually saw 42. All right. Observations by the telescopes Hawk and Lasso, these are big water shrank off telescopes, have shown that young and middle-aged pulsars are universally surrounded by bright spatially extended multi-TV emitting regions that we call TEV halos. Um, at least to me, this was very surprising and very exciting to learn this, but it has implications for this as well. Um, so just from energetics, you can deduce that the emission we're talking about here is, has to be produced through inverse Compton scattering of very high energy electrons and positrons. 
and uh, about 10% of or so of their total energy budget goes into the acceleration of these electrons and positrons. Hawk data furthermore has been used to suggest at, at roughly the three sigma level um, that millisecond pulsars generate TV halos at a similar efficiency, about 10% again. Um, three, three sigma might not be completely convincing yet, but with future data, um, especially by CTA, this should be an unambiguously resolvable question. At this point, it looks like millisecond pulsars generate TV halos. We'll know for sure one way or the other soon enough. So if millisecond pulsars do generate the GV excess in the galactic center, then the TV halos from those same sources should saturate or even exceed the observed TV emission as reported by the Hess telescope. Um, so I want to point out that this is from a relatively small annulus, a, a, a less than half a degree from the around the galactic center. Um, this is not the place you'd want to point a telescope to do this test, but it's the best we have because no one's bothered to point one of these telescopes a few degrees north of the galactic center. Um, but even with this data, I, I think we can basically rule out uh, uh, the possibility of millisecond pulsars could, could generate uh, the galactic center excess if they produce the same uh, kind of TV halos, because it just wouldn't leave any room for the various diffuse processes like pi and production and ICS and Brimschlung that you would expect from this part of the sky. Um, we could try to relax these constraints by cranking up the B fields and reducing the inverse Compton scattering, and but this would also, uh, to the synchrotron that would result, would uh, produce more radio emission that's observed. Uh, I really look forward to CTA um, in this respect. It should be able to either identify quite clearly the bright TV scale emission that would trace the morphology of the galactic center excess, thereby confirming the pulsar interpretation of the signal, or it could rule out the pulsar interpretation of the galactic center excess pretty clearly. Um, that's something I think uh, is very likely to happen. One, one of those two things is very likely to happen in the years ahead. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes or something, I'm going to turn from what we know now to what we might be able to do in the future, okay? In particular, I'm gonna ask the question, if this signal is the result of annihilating dark matter, where would we expect to see this uh, corresponding evidence of this process somewhere else? And I'm probably most excited in this context by uh, the dwarf galaxy population in the Milky Way. So right now, this is the sort of region that you wanna live in to explain the glass center excess with dark matter. And the current constraints shown in this black line kind of cut into the top part of this region, uh, but are, are not ultimately um, definitive, right? So if we could move these lines down by a factor of two or three, we could really, really test this hypothesis. It's, you know, tantalizingly close to our reach. Um, and that makes the Rubin Observatory even more exciting. So um, they're supposed to have first light almost any time. And in the years ahead, we should expect it to discover a large number of new Milky Way dwarf galaxies. So right now, we have about 50 dwarf galaxies that we can use in these gamma ray analyses. When we have 200 or 250 of these things, these Fermi constraints are going to become stronger. We don't need no more gamma ray data here. All we need to know is where the new dwarf galaxies are and where to look in the already existing Fermi data to confirm or, or test this hypothesis. Um, Fermi sensitivity in the Rubin era will depend on, on a little bit of how lucky we, we get. So it, it could be that uh, we discover two or three or four nearby high concentration dwarf galaxies, and that could substantially change Fermi's sensitivity to dark matter annihilating dwarfs. Or maybe those particular dwarfs don't exist and all the ones we get with Rubin are kind of far away or otherwise suboptimal, in which case the, it, you'll have more modest improvement. But all the same, I'm very excited to see what Ruben can teach us about our Milky Way's dwarf galaxy population and, and what it can therefore tell us about dark matter annihilating in dwarf galaxies. AMS has reported a measurement of the cosmic ray antiproton excess, which is very interesting in this context. In particular, they see a small excess in the 10 to 20 GeV range. And this excess is consistent with um, a, rough, a wimp of roughly the same mass and cross-section that I've been talking about throughout the rest of this talk. So here in this mass cross-section plane, this is the region favored by the galactic center, and this is the region favored by AMS's antiproton excess. If you just take this at base value, it's pretty highly, it's pretty statistically significant, more than four sigma. Um, but the reason that we, you may have never heard of this and not that many people are talking about it 
is that it, it suffers from significant uncertainties having to do with the, the anti-proton production cross-section. Um, usually when I tell particle physicists that there's this astrophysical measurement, and the reason we don't know how to interpret it is because of particle physics or nuclear physics and not astro astrophysics, they're surprised. But in this case, it's true. If we had a good laboratory measurement of the energy dependent differential anti-proton production cross-section and proton-proton collisions, we could settle this once and for all and find out if AMS is really seeing evidence for dark matter. But at this point, I think it's fair to say we don't know. We're also really excited for cosmic ray searches for dark matter using anti-deuterons and anti-helium nuclei. Uh, this is both with uh, GAPS, which is supposed to have its first flight in the next year or so, uh, GRAMS, which is a little bit farther down the road, and then AMS, which already has a ton of data and could really tell us about their anti-deuteron or anti-helium searches at any time. Um, these are all experiments that should be able to test this hypothesis, or at least very potentially. So here's the sort of region that's favored by the Galactic Center Excess, and you can see that these experiments are all providing constraints or, or projected constraints that are pretty close to the uh, parameter space I'm talking about here. So I, you know, stay stay tuned for that. And then lastly, um, I'm pretty excited about these upcoming or even ongoing deep radio searches, surveys for, for millisecond pulsars in the inner galaxy. So if millisecond pulsars do generate this excess, then future deep radio sur surveys should be able to detect the pulsed radio emission from these objects. Uh, for example, Green Bank with about 100 or so hours of observation should be able to detect a couple of these. Uh, Meerkat with a similar exposure should be able to detect a couple of dozen. And, and uh, hundreds should be detectable with a telescope array like SKA. Uh, Meerkat was commissioned, uh, I guess that's seven years ago now, and has already announced their first millisecond pul pulsar discoveries, although this is not in the Galactic Center because that's not where they are pointed. Um, but there's every reason to think that uh, Meerkat or SKA could meaningfully test this hypothesis. I would quickly concede um, that pulsars are responsible for the signal if SKA or Meerkat were to show that there was a, a spherically symmetric pulsar population with a kind of profile and, and numbers that, that uh, would be needed to generate the signal that way. All right, so let me just take a minute to summarize the main points I'm trying to make here today. Uh, first of all, indirect searches for gamma rays and cosmic rays are currently testing exactly the range of cross sections that are predicted for a generic thermal relic up to masses on the order of 100 GeV or so. Uh, in this sense, this program isn't some sort of fishing expedition. We're really meaningfully testing the thermal relic or WIMP paradigm. The Galactic Center's GV access remains compelling despite um, these previous claims of small scale power. Um, the signal is very statistically significant. Um, it's robust to astrophysical uncertainties. It's spatially extended, spherical, and not easily explained with known or proposed astrophysical mechanisms or sources. Earlier arguments claiming that this access is generated by near threshold point sources have not held up to scrutiny. And uh, recent studies have found that the morphology is of, of the signal is consistent with uh, sphericity, uh, with the signal, the, what you'd expect, predictions of annihilating dark matter, um, in contrast to previous claims that say the signal traces some combination of the bulge and bar stellar populations. Arguments based on the number of gamma ray bright millisecond pulsars, bright low mass X-ray binaries, and diffuse TV emission each disfavor millisecond pulsars as a sort of source of this emission, at least if these pulsars are like the kinds of pulsars we've seen elsewhere in the Milky Way. And future gamma ray and radio observations, as well as measurements of antimatter in the cosmic ray spectrum, will provide us with critical tests for the origin of the signal. I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for the invitation, for the chance to talk with you today, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. All right, so thanks, Dan, for that beautiful and very clear talk. Um, are there any other questions? We have a few during the talk. Uh, if it was pulsars, how hard is it to make the population be sufficiently square to the I would have no idea how to do it, is the answer. Um, the closest thing we have are models where there was a, primordially a, a large globular cluster population with lots of millisecond pulsars and those spiral in and spiral from a uh, dynamical friction get tidally disrupted and deposit their stellar material and cooling those pulsars. Um, but studies of this don't really suggest it would be perfectly spherical like this. It, it might be 
kind of bold shaped, for example, but that's not what we seem to be observing now. The steep profile is also difficult to attain. Yeah, let's let's just go back to that slide quick. So what, what I'm showing here is now that this the only place that has reports this information is in this kind of 0.2 to 0.5 degree annulus around the Galactic Center. So it's it's not where I would like the data, but this is what I have. The air, the red error bars are, are what they report. And then these two lines are what I predict the TV halos should produce if the millise if millisecond pulsar is responsible for the galactic center excess. Um, so it might look like it's even a good fit, but I think that's a coincidence because everyone knows that most of this emission should be coming from cosmic rays interacting with gas and radiation and things like this. So this has to be a component on top of all the standard stuff. And uh, there just isn't much room for a single uh, a component of the signal that's this big. So I think there's some tension here with that picture. What I really want is for CTA to get online and point two or three degrees north of the galactic center and do the same thing there. That should be very, very clear. Well, are you going to look for the TV halos in globular clusters? Yeah, yeah, of course. No, of course. Yeah, um, that will be one of the first things they should do, right? And not, not just that, but look at individual pulsars in the, in the near field as well. Do you have any pictures showing the excess going out to 20 degrees? Or... Um, sure. I mean, this isn't exactly the picture for this, but it will do the job. So these are error bars. Um, the, each of these colored error bars, you know, this one is just between 15 and 20 degrees. And you can see the size of the error bar on that component there. So what's setting the size of the error bar right there? Statistics. statistics yeah yeah it just it's kind of faint um but yeah and and you just a template fit so you're letting a pion template a brim template a, a ics template um a bubbles template and uh an isotropic template and this template all float in 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 a annuli and in that 15 to 10, the 15 to 20 degree annuli, that's that's the range of coefficients that it can take on. Some studies would argue that you can only see it with high statistical significance after like 15 degrees and some say 25, but 20 is about, about where it falls off. So maybe you said this, but what's the time scale for the anti-deuteron and the um, the radio measurements? So I mean, anti-deuterons are tricky because um, so AMS has a lot of data, and there's no reason like there's no, there's no data collection they need to do to have enough data to report an anti-deuteron. So you know they're sitting on this, and it, and it, it might be because they're trying to figure out systematics, and you know I don't know, and I don't have any way of guessing how long it will take them to share what they have. They have in conference talks they have shown a bunch of anti-deuteron and anti-helium events. Um, frankly, they've shown way too many of those events to possibly be real. So um, I it wouldn't surprise me if they're having leakage from mis misreconstructed events or something that they're, they're contending with is why it's taking so long. I'm not sure, there's speculation. Uh, GAPS is supposed to have their next first flight in the next year or so. Um, I don't know how long we'll take them to analyze their data, but probably within the next few years, we'll see that. Uh, Graham's a little bit farther off. And also uh, GAPS is hoping for three flights, as I understand. And uh, radio, um, so, like Meerkat exists, it, you know, and they people put in uh, proposals to get time on on, on Meerkat. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who has time to to do this analysis or has, has been awarded time on Meerkat. But if they did, 
and they were to point for 50 or 100 hours at, at the, again, just north of the Galactic Center, that's the best place to look by a couple of degrees, um, that, that should detect a dozen or two dozen or three dozen millisecond volts. I know, I know people who have, yeah. Um, I know Tracy has, among others. Um, I, to my knowledge, it hasn't been awarded though. You know, I, I can only speculate. Um, I, I don't think this is a priority of the radio astronomy community. I think that's fair to say. It's a lot of hours too. Most radio proposal awards are not 80 hours. So this is a big ask. I think that's part of it. So for the dwarf galaxy, are we certain about the mass and the uh, profile of the dark yeah, I mean, there, there are certainly uncertainties associated with uh, the mass and, 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 and profile of those dwarfs. The way you do it is, um, so you, you discover the dwarf using photometry, um, and then you follow it up with uh, spectroscopic uh, line sight velocity measurements of uh, the brightest stars, you know. And uh, when you're done, you, you extract what we call a J factor, which is proportional to the expected signal. And there are uncer uncertainties usually at a level of a factor of a few with each J factor. Um, so, so we know them, but imperfectly. Um, so you, in a perfect world, you would you'd nail down those J factors very, very tightly. And, and as telescopes get bigger, more stars will be observable spectroscopically and we'll be able to do that better. Um, but for now, that's what we have to work with. And the constraints I showed attempt to take those uncertainties into account. So sounds like it could be an exciting 10 years. <laughs> so let's uh, wrap up by thanking Dan again.